Welcome to part six of our series. This part's gonna cover the intro to navigation. As the name implies, it's a basic introductory course for learning the foundations of map reading, compass use, and even some GPS use. We're not gonna go over more advanced topics that'll let you go off trail, but rather give you a very solid foundation for your beginner type trips where you're mainly on trail, and a little bit so you can build up to those more advanced trips. This course will look at map types, such as a large scale, benchmark atlas types, the overview map, that's very popular trail map, such as the Trails Illustrator Net Geo, as well as the fine detail map, such as the USGS layers. These maps will let you go off trail, but it's good to know what they're used for and how to use them so you can do those more advanced trips in the future. Additionally, we're looking at print maps versus electronic maps, GPS versus, and smart device use, as well as the basics using a compass. During this particular video, we'll look at other topics such as reading terrain, the steepness of the terrain, topple lines, what the symbols mean, and other things that'll give you a good, solid understanding of basic navigation. After watching this video, you should be able to go out and navigate and plan some trips on trail. And in the future, you'll have the foundation you need for more advanced trips. To learn those more advanced skills, I'm gonna include some other resources and classes that will help you a lot as you get some more trips under your belt. Until then, let's look at the different map types. So the first thing we're going to cover is the New Mexico Road and Recreation Atlas by Benchmark. As I mentioned way back in the first part, is one of my go-tos when looking over for planning purposes. It gives a very large overview of the different trails and roads and some of the basic terrain. The reason why I'm looking at this, I can tell at a glance what kind of area it might be. Now, you're not gonna use this for navigation, but it's very, very, very helpful um, for just a quick large scale overlook, even more so than some electronic sources I'll show later. As it's one of my go-to items, I've been using them for years. I like it better than the competition and I just think it's a very good product to having a trip planning quiver. This is a close-up look at the Benchmark Atlas. For sake of a convenience, we're going to look at an electronic version of it on my computer screen. These Benchmark Atlases are in print form only for the most part. You can get some electronic versions to use your computer, but I tend to use the print form of these as I showed back in my first video. Now, the advantage of this is more so in the planning. You're not gonna do any navigation except while driving, but I like to look at this atlas so I get a lay of the land. I know, for example, that Route 4 over here is going to be a very good paved road. This gate over here is going to have a rougher Jeep road. And I also see our U.S. Forest Service road, and there's a campground not too far from it. At a glance, I can also see there's Los Alamos Laboratory. I know that's going to be locked because it's federal government slash military land, pretty much. But I also know, looking at this atlas, I can see Bandelier National Monument and some public lands. I can see some mid-level peaks, not as high as the 13ers, might be okay in say February or maybe March, definitely not December or January. And I can also see there are some valleys here as well as some higher peaks and mountains, etc. What the main advantage of this particular map is more for the initial trip planning and driving, of course. I wouldn't use it to navigate, but I find it extremely helpful for the initial trip planning. Um, using the Alice is also very good when you're on a road trip, but for the purpose of a beginner trip, it's one of the first resources I check and lets me suss out transportation options as well as shuttle options and what kind of vehicles I might need to get there, as well as uh, different ways of getting up there, how one way might be better than another. I know Route 4 is going to be paved and it'll be great. And if I was to take this land over here, it may not be in quite as good condition, but it has some interesting things I might want to see. So I'll just look at it as an initial place to start and not as a main navigation tool as some of the other resources we'll look at in a little bit. This map we're looking at is a very popular style of map for on-trail hiking. It has a somewhere in between the fine detail of other maps we'll look at later, used for a lot of off-trail hiking, but it doesn't have quite the broad overview of the benchmark atlas type maps I looked at and showed you earlier. The main, main advantage of these maps is that, again, for on-trail hiking, it's a good happy medium. It combines enough detail so you can figure out the peaks and the lakes and the streams and other things like that. 
without getting too much into the broad overview and you can actually use it for navigating on foot. You can see the trail markings here, how long they are, the different lakes through the shaded relief that we'll go into later when we actually read the map. You can pretty much make out the crests and the ridge. And overall, it's a very easy to read map type of map versus other layers. There are many different companies that make these type of maps. Nat Geo, also known as Trails Illustrated, makes some of the more popular maps. The disadvantage of this map, as I said, is the main thing that's not as detailed for off-trail hiking, but for on-trail hiking, it's really good as an initial navigation tool. And even if you are going off-trail, I like these maps because it gives a pretty good overview of when you're on the field versus more detailed maps you use for other things. Overall, as a good rule of thumb, if you find these type of maps are similar in an area, it usually means it's a good area for initial backpacking. Even with all the off-trail trips I do, I still carry a map of this sort because I do like the larger overview. And again, how easy it is to read when I want to navigate on a large scale. This version happens to be electronic, but just for illustration purposes, there's also print version of these maps as well. When we go into print versus electronic, I tend to have this type of map in print form as my overview, and I'll keep a lot more detailed type maps on my phone as needed. As I mentioned earlier, the Nat Geo map type map is an excellent larger scale overview map that shows the trails and is excellent for hiking on the beginner type trips that are sticking to trails and in popular areas. But what if you go off trail? What if you go to areas that aren't as popular? Well, then you need what's called the USGS map. The USGS map are the gold standards for map making. They're found for every place in the country and they give an incredible amount of detail, as you can see here. You can see the county lines. You can see the very steep contours that will go over in the map reading portion of this video. You can see the peaks. You can see the different lakes. If I'm going off trail and planning a route, I want to use these maps rather than the other maps I showed just a bit earlier. The disadvantage of these maps is that they're not as easy to read, as you can see. The trail and the trail numbers are a little harder to make out. Um, they're not as intuitive as far as the type of vegetation you're looking at and the relief shading versus the other more modern design we've seen on the other maps. And the other main disadvantage of this is that these maps have not been updated since the 1990s. Now, physical features are not going to change. The mountains are still going to be there. Joe V. Hill Lake is still going to be there. But there's a trail closure. If new trail is constructed, if there's a rock slide that closes a road on this map, it's not going to show up. So you need to use different types of maps. Some may be more detailed as this, some may not, but all of them will be more detailed than that geotype layer. More and more people are doing what I call open source maps. And a popular version is this open street map here. As you can see here. Now, unfortunately, the Pecos hasn't been as explored as much by the people who contribute to this map making. It has the very basic trails, but I really can't use it for navigating too much. One of my favorite layers that has a modern look has been updated in recent years and is very easy to read is the USFS 2016 layer. United States Forest Service, as you can tell by the name, it's been made pretty recently in 2016, has an amazing amount of details, very easy to read, and is my favorite layer of map to take when given the option. Now, one map is not necessarily better than other, just certain maps work for different situations. If I want that overview, I'm always going to take the Nat Geo type map. If I want more detail, I'm going to take the USGS map for anywhere in the country. But for areas like the Pecos, I want more detail. I'm going to take these very excellent United States Forest Service 2016 map, given the option. For ease of convenience and illustration purposes, this is an electronic version. But sometimes I'll take print or electronic version depending what I'm doing. And I'll cover that in a little bit. Why electronic versus why print? And why not one is not necessarily better than the other. It's just a different tool to serve a different need. And different tools in your kit work better than sometimes in other tools in the kit. I've mentioned the map key several times. This is an example from the National Geographic, also known as Trails Illustrated type map. The benchmark maps, to a lesser extent, the USGS maps I mentioned earlier, 
and any other print map is going to have a very similar, if a little different key. And the reason why I'm showing this is just so you can get a, a better idea what those symbols on the maps mean. What I find very good, as I mentioned, the benchmark, I can tell if something is a high clearance road where I might want a pickup truck or an SUV versus a true four wheel drive road where I better know what I'm doing and have a non-stock vehicle versus an improved road where any passenger car can make it. As far as our hiking purposes, you can see hiking trail, where I'll know I have it to myself, versus a hike and horse trail, which is a lot of what you find in New Mexico, versus a multi-use trail, such as found outside of Santa Fe, the immediate area, and towns like that. You can also see the different types of land boundaries, what might be private land, what might be the Bureau of Land Management, as well as where there might be visitor information and campgrounds and picnic areas as well as scenic overlooks where you can take a picture with your phone and other things too where how much trail mileage now i emphasize again not all the maps are going to have all this type of information and necessarily in this way but maps after a while i realize do have a lot of commonality you'll see the spring on almost every map i've ever read for example assuming there is water that's how you can tell there's water source for example pretty self-explanatory there's blue there's gonna be water what it cover is going to be green some maps are function as trail guides this will tell you for example with the key that this particular hike is really scenic or marked as one two three four and so on and national park type maps you might have these symbols to say where the lodge is or the ranger station or the fee station where you can buy some supplies and other things like that. So no matter which map you buy or which type of map atlas you get, this is a very good uh, key to look at. They're not as easy to find electronic versions, oddly enough, but the print maps are very prominent. And whenever I'm looking at a map, this is one of the first things I zone on so I can help read the map more clearly. So if you can read the key, you're halfway there to reading a map. And we'll cover that map reading in much more detail in a little bit. As mentioned earlier, we're going to go over maps in more detail. This particular map is Golden Gate Canyon State Park, near my old stomping grounds of Golden, Colorado. But what I like about this map, it does show a lot of the different types of things we're going to cover, as well as how to use a map in a field, but in a very easy to understand manner. Not many Pasco State Parks are in this quite detail, but this one's an excellent one for illustration purposes. Notice the legend or the key. I mentioned earlier, a lot of them will have similar information, if slightly different. But this one does have a lot of the information we discussed earlier, such as the names of the trails, or in this case, the symbols for the trails, where hunting is allowed, some private property, as well as such things, the visitor center, the ranger station, trailhead parking, any kind of backcountry campsites, or Appalachian tra trail style lean-tos. What this map also has, which is unusual for a state park map, is it has contour lines. It gives you at a quick glance where something might be steeper. This particular map is more of a hiker or trail friendly type map, so it doesn't have the super details of other maps, but it does give you an idea of what the terrain might be like at a quick glance. Looking at Tremont Mountain here, a little over 10,000 feet, I can see this is kind of an easier approach to get up to the summit than I was come from bootleg bottom. Notice how tight these lines are. The tighter the lines are together, the steeper it is. Now, as I mentioned, you wouldn't want to use this type of map for off-trail hiking, but it does illustrate some of these concepts on a very basic level. Looking at the Harmson Ranch guest house, I can see it's a wide, flat area, as you would expect from a lodge overlooking the mountain somewhere over here that's off the map. On the same token, I can see by the county boundary lines, this is also kind of a steep area compared to, say, this Fraser Meadow. What I like about these meadows here, the lines and line up just as you would say. Here's what looks to be um, a stream or a seasonal stream in a marsh, which you can tell just by the key I mentioned earlier. And it goes not too far from trails right next to this particular dude's fishing hole. No surprise, the blue means water. So even though this is a basic map, it's really well done to gain the fundamentals of map reading. Now, if you're hiking in a state park like this, this map is more than fine. In fact, it's excellent. It's a free map. You can print it out at home. Uh, you'll be able to navigate in this area just fine. The type of hiking you'll be doing on the CDT, I'll bring up our old friend, the U.S. Forest Service map. 
This is Pedro Park area, not too far from Cuba, right on the CDT. It's a very beautiful area. And this has a lot more detail than the state park map. I would never use this type of map when planning out routes and something like the CDT, but for state park, it's fine. But if I'm going to do the CDT, you can just see right away how much more detail there is. You can see, for example, the shaded relief. I can see there's a nice stream going through here. Very steep to climb out of there. But if I was to climb on top somehow in this treed area, because you can see the green, it'd be a flat summit area here. And if I really wanted to get this unnamed peak at a little over 10,000 feet, it might be easier to go off the San Jose Trail hike through here, which is a wide open field, and just kind of contour around these meadows over here. This also marks the trails, and this is from 2016, so it's fairly up to date. Just at a glance, you can just see the different topography. You're just gonna know instinctively now that this is a wide open area, fairly flat. You have these two little bumps here, and this is gonna be a treed area. And as I said, if you want to go hiking off trail, you would want to avoid something like this. This is going to be nice and gentle. This will be a bit more of a challenge, but not too bad. And if I was to come down to the stream here, it'd be very steep and hard to hike. You'll notice one thing right away, though. Though the CDT goes through here, it's not marked on this map. Even the most up-to-date maps don't always contain all the latest trail information, which is a problem sometimes with these maps that are updated as regularly. What happens a lot is that people use different layers as a base. I apologize for the blurriness of this map. It's the only one I could find online easily. But they'll trace in the CDT or a similar trails. So this happens to be the USGS layer I mentioned earlier. And I'll adjust the layers so you can see that. So this is Pedro Parks with the USF, USFS 2016 layer. And we'll put on the USGS layer, which, as I mentioned before, is very detailed. It's kind of the gold standard. Not quite as easy to read, but it does have a lot of the similar trails because they haven't changed that much over the years. And you can still see where it's wide open. You can see the contour lines from before. And you can see those two bumps I mentioned. Let me show that again. And there we have the same two bumps, just read differently. I think this is a lot easier map to read. But as I said, it doesn't have the CDT on it in Pedro Parks. This gentleman named Jonathan Lay took the USGS layer and traced the CDT on it along with some alternate routes. The problem with that is that it's kind of hard to see even without the blurriness of my screen here because of all the different detail and it's just kind of hard to make out when you're doing on-trail hiking. This type of map, as we said earlier, is great when you do an off-trail, but when you do an on-trail hiking, a lot of times different layers are easy to read. Luckily, the CDTC, who you're also working with for some of these classes, made their own set of maps for the contents of the Vi Trail. This one happens to be Glacier National Park, but it still illustrates the concepts well. It has the mileage markers for the CDT. It's an extremely easy, well-done map to read with some more modern formatting. You can see the shaded relief will show you what is a steep side. I know it's going to be almost cliff-like as you go by Mount James here. We have some lakes and streams. Looks like a bowl to me here. And I know this area, as an example, is slightly more open, whereas over here will be very steeper to hike. Not that you'd want to hike off trail and glacier, but it just serves in a great example. If I did want to hike off trail, I know, for example, this might be a little easier to go through the wooded area to this tarn or lake over here. When hiking on trail, which is what most beginners will be doing, these type of maps are excellent both for showing where the trail is in relation to a known trail like the CDT, as well as um, some easier to read information if you do decide to go off trail. These trail specific maps are more of a corridor, so it's not gonna have all the, the details you might get from those larger Trails Illustrated or Nat Geo maps I showed earlier. Just to show the differences too between a CDT specific map and a part a map that might contain the CDT. Let me show you the Nat Geo layer mentioned earlier. We're going to look at Glacier National Park. So I type it in here.
Takes a sweet time loading up. You can see it's starting to populate with all the different things you can find in Glacier National Park. And there's our good friend, the CDT. So this Nat Geo map, which you can buy print or electronic, happens to show the CDT well marked. These maps, of course, aren't going to cover the entire CDT, which is why you want the CDT specific maps for Glacier and New Mexico, of course. And you can do some open source type maps as well. Now that's just one basics of it, is looking at the map. In a little bit, I'm going to show you the compass. Then we're going to show you how to use a map with a compass, again, for a basic introductory beginner-friendly type level. Then we'll show you some electronic aids to put this all together as well. So that's kind of a quick overview of using maps, and hopefully it'll give you some information you need to start planning some trips. The other part of traditional navigation is learning to use a compass. Now, when you're starting out and sticking to trails, you want to know more of the basics of compass use, mainly how to find magnetic north, east, west, south, and the other compass directions you're familiar with, such as northwest or northeast. There are much more advanced concepts, such as true versus magnetic north, as well as what's called declination to make this difference. But that's going to complicate things when you're just starting out. You do need to know these concepts when going off trail and certainly for more advanced trip planning. But these basics never change and they're going to serve you well for your initial forays to on-trail backpacking. Later on, I'll include some uh, links that give some excellent lessons when learning these more advanced concepts. And I encourage you to look at it as you get more comfortable and want to learn additional skill sets. But for now, we'll just go over the basics that help you very well. This particular illustration is from REI. It does a great job of showing you the basics of a compass. This compass that's showing is just a very standard one. You can get more complex compasses. But even as your skills advance, I find a basic compass works extremely well. I like to keep it simple, and it serves my needs. You can see with the direction of travel, very um, self-explanatory, the distance you're traveling in as well as the compass directions such as north and south, east and west, and how it can rotate. And if you want to get a little more detail, there's the actual degrees. Again, this is just a basic compass. The main takeaway from this is what's called a magnetic north arrow right here. A compass is always pointing to what's called magnetic north, which the advanced lessons will uh, discuss true north. But for most of your on-trail backpacking, you need to line it up with the shed and this is the red compass, also known as putting red Fred in the shed, to find not just magnetic north, but also see where east and west are aligned. There's a great illustration here from a hunter's education website that shows how to do red Fred in the shed. All you do is rotate yourself so that the compass is lined up correctly. You can see the magnetic north, which is red, is in the shed. And we now know that magnetic north is here, as well as west, and east and so on. We know due to the direction of travel arrow, this particular hunter is going roughly um, southwest or 240 to be more precise. This is just a very basic lesson, but even as you get more advanced, these basic lessons will serve you well for navigation. Even with the hiking I do, I find just a quick compass check to know where basic north is works very well for my needs, and it'll certainly work very well for you and you're on trail. I encourage you to look at the links I'm going to give you later to increase your navigational skill set. But for now, this basic lesson will serve you very well. Map and compass use is one of the basics of navigation. Having these basic skills serve as a building blocks for further skills in the backcountry. When you're on a nice, beautiful open area like here in the Latier Peaks on a sunny day, oftentimes just having a map is enough to know where you are. You can see where the trail is up ahead. You can line up the map so you know where you're going. Pretty straightforward. But if it gets overcast or even stormy, or if it's a wooded area, or if you come to a trail junction, knowing how to use a compass is very useful. Here we have the devil duck learn these very skills. He's not quite there yet. 
He's looking at the map. The compass is a little skewed off, but maybe after watching this video, he too will have the basic skills to navigate correctly. The first step is getting out the appropriate map and figure out where you want to go. Notice in this, they have a large scale overview map of Yosemite, along with a smaller map that will give more detail. It doesn't have the broad overview, but it has certainly more detail. These uh, particular people are trying to figure out where they want to go. That's the first step. Let's say we want to go to this map over here to the northeast. Well, in that case, we need to line up our compass. Here we have a person doing red fret in the shed. They're going to know where north and northeast in this case is, and they can put that in relation to their map. If you remember earlier, I did mention magnetic versus true north. Again, that's more of an advanced skill that some other resources will explain. But most of the time, just even know where magnetic north is is just enough. Even for more advanced navigation, this serves as one of the building blocks. And you'll still use it. I certainly use it. And sometimes it's just quick to get a simple magnetic north bearing. I know where north and east and west and south is. For the most part, I can just as needed. And it's often just enough to get me where I have to go. And if you're on trail, that's certainly going to be the case for you as well. To line up north, here's a good illustration of it. Remember we mentioned Red Fred in the shed? Here's Red Fred. Here's the shed. We know where north is, east, west, and south, and we're good to go that way. But now we have to relate it to the map. Pretty straightforward as well. You place your map, a compass on the map. You make sure it's lined up north. Notice how there's a north direction arrow on the map. Most maps have a similar type of item. Um, not always. You can assume, though, that most of the lines are north and south unless stated otherwise on the maps. Notice the key here. We can extrapolate. This might be something like a backcountry campsite. These are the trails. This is probably a ranger station or similar, and the mountains are just to the north. And a meadow of sorts is just to the south, and the trail is running east and west. Pretty straightforward. Again, these are basic instructions, but these basic building blocks will never go away for you. In the field, it's going to be slightly different, of course, versus a nice ideal illustration as shown here. What you want to do in starting out, you might find it easier to put the map on the ground. Using some rocks and lining up the map with a compass works really well. As you get more comfortable with the map and compass, you can fold the map like here and line it up with a compass. And that seems to work pretty well, too. I still do both, depending. Um, if it's windy, just put the rocks down as this person has, or if you're comfortable, do it that way. And that's pretty much it for basic map and compass use. These skills, as I said, will never go away. Even the basics will serve you well into the future. And as I said a few times now, please check out the advanced skill sets and the links to them and practice, practice, practice. And this will lead you on to many further and fun adventures. Electronic maps and navigation can be divided into two very distinct areas, in my opinion. There's a trip planning portion, which can include printing out the maps, as well as using these resources in the field on your GPS or GPS-enabled device, which nowadays typically means a smartphone. There's many different software out there with many different capabilities and ways of using. I cannot hope to do a complete software tutorial. That could be a lengthy video on its own. What I can do is show you on a general level how to use these resources. I have Gaia GPS up. Gaia GPS is a very user-friendly tool that will have many different map layers. Here we have the USFS layer with San Pedro Parks. And you zoomed in there so you get a better view. Uh, it's very user-friendly, has all kinds of different layers you can mix and match. Here's the Nat Geo layer, USGS layer. You can combine layers to see at once too. As you can see, I'm doing right there, this is the USGS with the USFS layers. You can get different views that way because different maps will show different things. A little harder to read. And just for clarity, I'm just going to use one layer if I at least wanted you to see that. You can plan routes that way, which is very handy. And again, different software works a little differently, but the similarities end up being the same. And I'm just kind of tracing a, a route here on the San Jose Trail. And that works pretty well. And you can see it automatically tells me I've gone about a mile and a half with 150 feet gain and so on and so forth. And what you do with this is twofold. Obviously, you're planning it as in right here. 
And once you save it, you can export it into a data file. All the data files for this type of software ends up being what's called GPX, which is the older format, or KML, which is the newer format. We don't need to get into the technicalities. All you need to really know about these two formats is that it's a data file that can be read by other GPS software to overlay a map. And we'll go into that in a little bit. But in any case, different software lets you plan it. Gaia's main advantage, besides the different map layers available, is that it's really easily to use with Gaia GPS, which in many ways might be the best um, GPS-enabled software for your smartphone. Having said that, another popular tool is CalTopo. CalTopo is free for the basic functionality, but it does give a lot of functionality if you pay the subscription. That's not much money. If Gaia GPS is user-friendly, think of CalTopo's Photoshop, if you're familiar with that. A very powerful piece of software that takes a while to learn all the nuances, but once you know the nuances, it can be extremely useful and beneficial. Many people, myself included, will like to plan out routes with CalTopo and certainly print maps with it, but use Gaia GPS importing that GPX file I mentioned earlier into the app you can use on your phone. As you can see, you can export, once I make a route here anyway, <laughs> um, different places, and CalTopo will even show some of the trails right away. And so CalTopo is powerful, but not quite as user-friendly. One neat thing about all these software, though, too, for route planning, as I've mentioned in earlier videos, is I really enjoy using the Google Satellite View. I think it can show a lot of different things. You can see the terrain, of course, at a glance, and it's really easy to read that way. You can tell where the mountains are climbing out and the creeks and the valleys and the small canyons. Um, but you can go even more into the satellite view. That's extremely beneficial. Uh, I find more so for driving. Not so much in this area because it's all trails, but notice how the trails overlay on the actual terrain. So that, that's pretty neat, I think. And I think it can be useful for driving purposes. Now, how you use this in the field is twofold. You can print out a map. I happen to print out this map and as a PDF for my friends, and I sent it to them on a ski trip. Uh, the Nat Geo layer is pretty easy to read. It's well-defined trails, that's why I use that. But if we're gonna do more involved trips, uh, I might send a different layer. I find CalTopo to have a better printing capability. we will show here. You can choose PDF or JPEGs, or you can also download, as I mentioned, those two file formats. And it's just a user-friendly way of printing. I'm not going to go through it all, but you can just pick what you want. It makes a PDF. But sometimes it was just as easy to do the Nat Geo layer, which is what Gaia GPS has. Now, in the field, it's going to be a little different. You absolutely want to pre-download all your maps, depending on the software. Gaia has one that I really like. Um, CalTopo has one that's in kind of advanced beta stage, but Gaia works pretty well overall. You absolutely want to download the map at home with your Wi-Fi connection. Smartphones have a built-in GPS. You do not need a cell phone signal to use that as long as you download the map ahead of time. You're essentially downloading the map and you enable the GPS to tell you exactly where it is via satellites. All phones nowadays have a built-in satellite receiver. And with that, it can work like a commercial grade GPS, or at least on a basic level, to tell you exactly where you are if you have the maps downloaded. Very beneficial in whiteout conditions or in tricky places in navigation. This, I believe, is the iPhone picture. You can see it's using different layers if you want to that I download ahead of time. This is the built-in Gaia layer. Uh, doesn't really matter which one it is, but it all works the same. This carrot tells you exactly where you are, and this is the track. And we know we're not too far from Moran Point, and Union Point just down the trail that away. Very useful. Again, make sure you download it ahead of time at home with a Wi-Fi connection. A lot of times you won't even get a cell signal, and you won't be able to use it that way. As long as you have the map downloaded, you can use the built-in GPS ability to use it. Another popular tool, uh, as far as that functionality, is the Avenza maps. I mentioned the Jonathan Lay maps earlier. You can download his maps for free using the app that's also free the thing about avenza is that there's many of these what i call open source maps such as for the cdt 
Uh, but there's also some commercial maps you pay um, by the map in the store. A lot of people like Avenza because it has many different maps for many different people that uh, they have submitted, but it can get expensive depending on what you're doing. None of these tools are perfect. Think of them as I like to say different tools in your kit. Some are going to work better than others. I use Avenza once in a while. I find I use CalTopo a lot for pre-planning as well as Gaia itself to a lesser extent, but definitely use Gaia in the field more. Now, if you're doing a specific trail, like the Continental Divide Trail, you can use specific apps. A very popular one is called the Atlas Guides or colloquially known as the Gut Hook app after the creator's nickname. It'll show you the CDT exactly with this particular layer. It'll give you different options to choose from. It'll give you lots of good information and it's very easy to use. It's what's called a corridor or a strip map. It's only going to show the CDT and not other trails around it, such as other layers, as you might be used to, and these layers for you to print. If we do in a specific trail, it works really well. You can do that, and that's fine. A lot of people will print overview maps just in case they have to bail. So you're doing something very specific and just hiking the CDT, not taking side trails or alternates, it works pretty well. The disadvantage is if you want to do more than just the CDT and plan your own routes, you might want to use something like Gaia or CalTopo or other software and import it into Avenza. Again, it's not that one tool is better than the other. It's just that certain tools work for better things. Um, I don't do as many straightforward trails anymore, so I tend to use a combination of CalTop, CalTopo and Gaia. That's what just works for me. If you're doing the CD to the Appalachian Trail or similar, look in the Atlas Guides and they work very well. That's just a very quick overview of the different software packages. Uh, this will by not any by any means will give you all the information you need to use this software, but should make you comfortable enough to figure out how to use it. And there's very a lot of tutorials for the specific packages out there, including some I'll give at the end of this video. I find it very amusing when people talk about print maps versus electronic maps. The reason why I find it so amusing, it's like debating what's better, a hammer or a screwdriver. There are two different tools that fit two different needs and work for different purposes. Almost every week, Joan and I in our kitchen table will put out this large map or similar one, as you can see here, and just print out our route. And we'll often take these maps in the field because we love the larger overview. At the same token, we'll take these very detailed guides, or sometimes we'll print it out or even make a PDF to our phone, or maybe these hand-drawn canyoning maps with lots of detail with some notes we'll put on it. And we'll often look at electronic maps that also have fine detail. So even with trip planning, it's two different maps and resources fit different needs. And we'll have them both electronically and print. We appreciate how the print map doesn't run out of batteries and it's always there. We don't have to worry about it accidentally fall into water because it's reasonably waterproof versus say a phone. On the other hand, we can only carry so many maps. So even planning or in the field, we like different things. And there's just so many different resources to use. We'll use a similar four wheel drive guidebook, not because we're going off roading, just because we want to see what looks good for our stock four wheel drive vehicle. You know, recognize the benchmark atlas. So we're even combining different resources and printouts that'll assist us in what we're doing. In the field, as you can see here, I have a wide overview map of Rocky Mountain National Park. I can see what mountains are in the distance. I can get at a glance what trails are coming up. And it's a lot easier to use than a five inch phone screen. On the other hand, this five inch phone screen that my friend here is using tells us exactly where we are in this meadow. There's no guessing. And we can figure that with some old school map and compass use that we'll go into later. But sometimes it's a lot easier to just simply look at a phone. It's one thing to have the skill, it's another thing to use it. I can balance my checkbook without a calculator. It's certainly a lot easier to use a calculator. I never write checks anymore. It's just funds coming out of my bank. So I rather just use the electronic tools that makes things easier. On the same token, I'm really happy I can do basic math. And that's the same way with map and compass. Depending what I'm doing, sometimes it's easier to look at a map, sometimes easier to use 
electronic phone. At the end of the day, I'm still reading a map and using the right tools to navigate and find out where I am. Print maps are still going to be used. This is where trip I planned. And I printed out the maps because I liked having that as a backup. Sometimes it's quicker in the field to pull out a map than look at my phone. On the other hand, here it is winter, and it's not whiteout conditions, but it can easily turn. A GPS-enabled device, such as my phone with a particular software, is make things a lot easier mapping compass. Certainly some blowdowns is pictured here, as you see my friend having trouble going through. And with a map, we figure it out, but sometimes not always that easy, as you can see. And definitely, as you can see here, I actually do have a phone handy. We're in the thick woods. There's some spring snow. The trail is buried under the snow. We could have done with a map and compass and some dead reckoning. Again, we'll go into that in a little bit. But with a map, we had the large overview to know that the trail was down at the end of this drainage. But the phone made it so much easier just to find a way until we more or less ended up where we thought the trail would be. So two different tools used together to make life easier. It's not good to be dogmatic. Just pick the right tool that's going to work for you and what you're doing. It's one thing to insist that you should know how to read a map and use a compass. Another thing to say you never need anything. And we should learn to embrace new tools and use them as appropriate. You can have lots of fun on trail just using a simple map. Or you can go off trail. This particular ridge in the Sangres in Colorado was pretty easy to follow with a map. But when we got off the ridge and went into the woods, we can find phone devices a lot easier. So at the end of the day, pick the right tool for the job. Not everything requires a hammer. Not everything requires a screwdriver. It's not this versus that. It's how are the two tools going to complement each other. Know how to use both tools in the backcountry, and you'll have a great time. And that concludes our introduction to Mapping Compass Electronic Navigation. As the name applies, it's more of a familiarity uh, with the basics of map and compass use and how to navigate. These basics certainly serve as an excellent foundation. It'll use not just on introductory trips and going forward, but it also serves as you to have the basics to learn some more advanced techniques. Once you've gone a few trips and start feeling comfortable, I really urge you to look at some other material to get a more in-depth look at Map and Compass Electronic Use. My personal favorite one that I recommend to many people, and one I'll have in the description of the video below in the comments section area, is the Columbia River Orienteering Club 18-part um, series on navigation. It is fantastic. It is free. It's probably close to two hours. You can divide it with the chunks. It goes over not just the basics of map and compass, more in-depth things such as steepness and grades, relief shading, uh, magnetic declination, as well as a really in-depth look at both CalTOPO and Gaia GPS and how to bring all these different tools together and for more in-depth trip planning. Uh, price is right. I cannot recommend it enough. What I do urge you to do is now that you know some of the basics, please get out there, start planning some trips, and use these skills. The best way to learn isn't just simply looking at videos and looking at different gear reviews, but actually getting out there and do it. Practice these skills and remember always to be comfortable, be safe, and have fun. I hope this gave you some basic skill sets you can use to get out there, and I hope to see you on the trail sometime. Happy trails!